Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. You're looking live at a mega whale created by Jeff and his bakers at Vinman's Bakery in beautiful downtown Ellensburg, Washington. Can I get closer? You see the serpentinite, you see the metamorphic rock. <laughs> Vinman's Bakery in beautiful downtown Ellensburg, you've got to love it. Come on in for our cookies, bars, and scones. Come on in for our muffins and coffee cake. Come on in for our pastries. We're not open Sundays and Mondays, but we have a bread schedule. Thank you, Jeff. Mega whale, you gotta love it. Welcome everybody. The local time is 1.48 in the p.m. on an absolutely gorgeous Wednesday afternoon here in Ellensburg. It's over 40 degrees, sunny skies, full moon overnight. Great stuff. And we will begin our program I'm out of breath. <laughs> we'll begin our program at the top of the hour. That's about 12 minutes from now. So you know that if you're watching this in replay, the beginning of the program will start in 12 minutes. Are we doing okay? Five by five? We are. Thank you. Let's say hi to a few of you. And thank you all for being with us here today. We will be using Mega Whale somehow in our program. There's uh, Bill. <laughs> Canadian Entropy, hello. Where are you viewing from? Calgary, Alberta, Ottawa, Canada, Oakland, California, Webb Lake, Wisconsin, Powell River, British Columbia, Drain, Oregon, Lauren, the Netherlands, Sandpoint, Idaho, Aberdeen, Scotland, Bay Strip, Texas, Cincinnati, Ohio. Hans is from the Netherlands also. Tezuch is checking in from Hobart, Tasmania. CMT Golfer is from Newcastle, England. Murumbina, Australia. Stockton, California. Rockland, California. Kamloops, BC. Springfield, Oregon. Milwaukee, Oregon, the greater Portland area. Glasgow, Scotland. Denmark, the Netherlands. Boulder, Colorado. The Netherlands. Bunny, Oregon. Windy, Chicago, reports Kathleen or Catherine, excuse me, Michigan. Hello, James. Sven from Hamlin, Germany, wants to know about kielbasa. Yeah, man. Uh, David says, we will definitely stop at Vindman's the next time we go through Ellensburg. Well, that's great. Yeah, it's just been fun. Um, let me email the guest, and then I will uh, tell you a little story about Mega Whale and Jeff down at the bakery. Is Jeff with us here today? Add guest, copy link. Sending an email to Victoria, BC, to Joanne Nelson, our guest today. All right, there goes the, uh, there goes the email. Uh, Don says hello from Fairbanks, Alaska, Marysville, Washington, Cleelum, Washington, 
Eastern Milan's belt, says Rachel. Uh, uh, Skagit Ed says Vinman's is on the bucket list. And Geneva reports that uh, Vinman's Bakery is in the house. Okay, so, yeah, you know, um, Jeff is a busy guy. Jeff, the owner of Vinman's Bakery. And I think uh, maybe Sunday, maybe Monday of this week, he said, well, we got, we got plans for making a mega whale for you. What show would be good for that? And I thought about it and thought, well, maybe Saturday. And then I, I, and then I, I, I changed my mind and I said, no, I, I, think, I think Wednesday's show would be good. So I said, I'd be happy to drop by and pick it up from you, however big it's going to be, Jeff. And so he texted me uh, with a photo at maybe 4.30 yesterday afternoon, Tuesday afternoon, and showed me the photo of Mega Whale before it went into the oven. He said, can you swing by in about an hour and we'll uh, load it up in your van. So I did that after hours and Jeff, you know, just works around the clock anyway. So it was just he and I, and we're looking at admiring Mega Whale, which you'll get another look at it, uh, once we start the program. And it had just come out of the oven, and it was warm, and it was kind of soft. And it was hard for us to, oh, I might as well show it to you again. Basically, to finish the story, we got it, uh, Jeff and I, carefully lifted warm mega whale out into the back of the family van. And uh, it was decided that it would stay in the van overnight to cool off and firm up. And then at about 6.30 this morning, I drove the van with mega whale in the back, and the whole van smelled like a bakery. A couple of the maintenance guys were working already, and I said, hey, can I get a hand? And they said, oh, yeah, what is this? And so we got, we got the mega whale into the, into the building here, and then I had to find something to prop it up because it was still too fragile. Hi, Joanne. I'm glad you're in there. Can you hear me okay? Can you wave? It? Oh, can you hear me okay? Yes? I hope so. Okay, good. Um, and feel free to share your screen, uh, uh, Joanne, if you like, uh, and get that in the green room. Well, it looks like you're doing it right now. That's terrific. Oh, wonderful. We don't have to worry about that. Thank you, Joanne. Looking forward to visiting with you. Uh, okay. Well, so yeah, I, I um, so to getting getting Mega Whale in here was one of the challenges. The other challenges was how how am I going to hold it up without breaking it because it's 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 a Mega Whale, man. So I found uh, one of the drawers from the cabinet in the Geology 101 lab room, basically a rock cabinet. And uh, I, I got some of the packing tape from the supply room in the faculty area. And uh, Jeff really went the extra mile. Um, if you're new to us, you have no idea what's going on. I get that. Um, but uh, yeah, beautiful little eye here with some olives and some Valentine Day hearts. And here's the mouth of the mega whale, of course. And then this is uh, good old fashioned bread. And then this is bread that I don't know how he did it, but created some kind of mottled, marbleized looking serpentinite for us. Ophiolite basically in the mega whale. And then some of this more exotic looking migmatite. Maybe we got part of the Chelan migmatite basically. Okay, let me pause for a second. I keep seeing stuff about the audio being too hot. I, I know this mic has been hot lately, but I, I don't know how to fix it, and we're almost done, done with the program. John, I got you. I got you, John. I got you, John. Is everybody else agreeing that the audio is uh, obnoxious? Or are we doing okay? If I, if I try to keep my mic down a little bit. Audio, I'm just pausing here for just a bit. I can't turn down the gain. I don't know how to do that, Oscar. Audio is fine for me. A bit distorted. Yeah, I'll just try not to get too amped, I guess. Let me check my YouTube window, but I'm almost sure I'm muted. I am. Sounds okay. I'll try to keep it low. Yeah, I'm persnickety, and I, I've noticed that I keep bringing this mic further and further down my shirt, but I really don't want to get into the, the details at this. Uh, yeah, I just got to calm myself down, Snarky, that's all. Okay, 
So let me give you one more close-up look at the mega whale before I put it away, and I will be using it somehow today. Mega whale with a little packing tape. Oh. All right. couple more hellos to everybody. Uh, Joanne, if this works for you, this is great. I see your shared screen and it's entirely blue right now. And if that if that's good for you, then, then that's great. Okay, good. Um, yeah, it weighs a fair amount. Uh, yeah, anybody else that, uh, uh, I think I'm done talking about the, the mic. I'm sorry. I, do, I don't want to be distracted by that. So hopefully it's, it's workable for you. Where else are we viewing from? We're going to say hi to a few more, and then we will get started. I'm excited for today's episode with Joanne. I think you'll really enjoy her. Carol's in beautiful Florida, and Mike is in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Chris is in Renton, Washington. David's in Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, Gazelle, California. That's Shay. Parma, Idaho. Tucson, Arizona. Pikes Peak Batholith. That's Chris with a K. Spokane Valley. Medieval Creature says, greetings from the Southern Rocky Mountain Trench. Well, that'll come up today. Rick's in Costa Rica. Lindsay says, hi from Discovery Park and a beach with green rocks. Oh, Lindsay's watching on her phone right now. That's nice. Uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, thank you for all the sounds good. That makes me feel better. Uh, greetings from Greece. Hello. Nice to see you today. Must be evening there, I'm guessing. North Carolina. Arlington, Texas, Philomath, Oregon, Puyallup, Washington, Outwash, Washington, never heard of it, Chuck's in Costa Rica, hi Chuck, uh, Seattle, Sonora, Arkansas, Heinsberg Thrust Fault, that's Lorraine, Somerset, UK, Regensburg, Germany, Menominee, Wisconsin, no, Menominee, Michigan, Wellington, uh, Kentucky, Clyde Park, Montana, Fresno, California. I mean, I'm trying to keep my volume down, but I also don't want to like lose my energy. That's, come on. So I, you know, I might have to scream a little bit. I'm a screamer. Okay, good. I got two minutes before we begin. And I just want to say one more time, thank you as always for joining us live, viewers. We have uh, approaching 600 right now. And we'll begin the program in two minutes. Hot mic. Okay, you can't think about the technology. Focus on your guest. Keep it peppy as usual. Let's not be too cutesy with the props, okay? You got scissors. You got a mega whale. That's fine, but you need a purpose. Do you have a purpose? Yeah, I think you do. You're going to start with the old grainy chalkboard. You're going to lay out the four models one more time. You're going to add a twist, emphasize the twists. That gets used to the whale and the mega whale. And then the main chalkboard to set up Joanne is the separate chalkboard. And that needs to be dwelled upon but not be labored over because she's going to take much of that and run with it. You're setting up Joanne. You're excited to talk to Joanne. The viewers will love Joanne. Don't get in her way. Set her up and let her go. Set her up and let her go. Let the words flow. You can do this. Just let the words flow. Keep the energy up and the volume down. Energy up and the volume down. This will be a good show. Allow it to happen. Allow it to happen. Let it flow. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA, home of Central Washington University. I'm your host, Ned Zinger, and it's great to have you with us here yet again at the Baja BC A to Z headquarters. We're close to the end of the alphabet, but there's still plenty of new things to learn. 
and I'm excited for today's show. I'm especially excited for today's show. I enjoyed meeting my guest just a few days ago, and she has plenty to offer us. And we're going to go to her momentarily. But momentarily might mean about, I don't know, 10 minutes or something like that. Maybe even 15 if I get on a roll here. But I do want to set up Joanne Nelson in my own style. So let's go ahead and try it. Uh, we're talking about uh, wondering if there's a cryptic suture in the shales or the Paleozoic sedimentary rocks of the Canadian Rockies. And if I go to the geologic time stick, which I haven't gone to in a long time. Remember, I still have this thing. Here's the geologic time scale, Precambrian, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. And yeah, uh, Baja Beast exotic terrain stuff from two years ago. Crazy Eocene from last winter. Uh, most of our northward translation that we're talking about and discussing with Baja BC is between 85 and 55 million years ago. That's all fine. That's all well and good. I think Joanne Nelson is going to be taking us back to the Paleozoic today and looking at some sedimentary rocks that you can follow through uh, northern Canada and the implications, the importance of following those continuous beds will become clear once we visit with Joanne. But instead of going right to the Kachika trough and, and listening to Joanne, I feel like I do want to set the stage a little bit using some of the concepts that we've had before. It almost looks like I'm out of ideas. What is this guy doing? Am I just mailing it in? Am I like mentally in Cancun right now? I just keep writing the same stuff on the board. No. Well, yes, I do. <laughs> I have been writing these four models involving Baja BC, yes or no, uh, in, in the last few shows. That's true. But I feel like I want to keep adding flavors, keep adding twists, keep coming up with new ways to think about these four models. And I really don't know where our guest is today with any of these four models. And maybe she doesn't even want to talk about it. I don't know. But I do feel like I want to set up our discussion with Joanne by revisiting, but also adding a new little a few little flavors with these four models. Flat slab subduction, hit and run, fixed archipelago model, ribbon continent. That's been really, we've been going back and forth between those four models since Christmas. Paleomag. Do you believe in paleomag? Do you recognize the importance of the robust paleomagnetic data sets? Yes or no? Well, Flat Slab famously has just ignored Paleomag for 50 plus years. But all three of these other models are accommodating, or at least they're not ignoring the paleomagnetic data. And therefore, these models are trying to accommodate various amounts and various numbers of offset with the paleomagnetic data. That got us into the concept of a whale or a mega whale. And the whale concept was tied to the hit and run model of Basil took off and Bernie Housen. Realizing that we have potentially, and I didn't make up this concept of a whale, I borrowed it, I lifted it off of somebody, maybe Daryl Cowan, I don't know. But the idea of a whale swimming north up the west coast of North America is our concept of taking uh, the hit, the stuff that hit insular super terrain and sending it north up the coast and our focal point before Christmas was primarily this whale. And yes, Vinman's made a couple of whales for us, a regular whale and then a stunt whale, if you remember. And that was our focus. Then after Christmas, we started dealing with the Paleomag people in particular, including Randy Enkin, who I'm still stunned that he came up with the concept of mega whale the night before I came up with it, independent of each other. And that got us to the concept of saying that insular and intermontane need to be joined together before this northward, this proposed northward translation. And so it's a much bigger part of North America's crust that's moving north. Okay, well, I've got something I want to do with the chalkboards in just a second. But that's mega whale that is not a huge feature of Karn and Mitch in the fixed archipelago because they're down in the lower mantle. But their animation showed a mega whale. But the biggest, uh, the biggest proponents of a mega whale, at least to this point in the series, have been the ribbon continent modelers, the people who like to have a major chunk of Western North America heading north, mega whale. 
So that comes to the point then, if you have a whale or if you have a mega whale, what's on the eastern side? What's on the eastern edge of that whale? Whether it's a whale or a mega whale, where's the oceanic suture? where you close a basin to get the whale to hit North America. And then is it that oceanic suture that's the place where we're having this Baja BC fault activity? And I may be putting words in people's mouths now, but I felt like I just wanted to try it. So Basil mentions Churn Creek as an interesting place to him, and it might be the next place to go. Basil took off. And so he's thinking about Churn Creek in British Columbia within the intermontane superterrain as a potential spot to look for Baja BC fault. He wouldn't be the first to go in there, but he's wondering if he can do some things on the ground that haven't been done before. Uh, I grabbed just a kernel, just a little vocal clip from Mitch Mahalanuk's episode uh, where he just kind of threw out maybe Cache Creek, also in the intermontane, might be the place where we have this, this cryptic oceanic suture, but more importantly, this place where we're doing a lot of northward mo motion. But the most recent few shows with the Ribbon Continent guys were proposing the Tintina Fault. Ironically, the only fault we can see from space, like people have been looking for more than 50 years for a Baja BC Fault. Wouldn't it be crazy if the one we can see from space is the actual fault? <laughs> But we'll talk about today why it's not an open and shut case to have the Tintina Fault be a place of major movement, more than 400 kilometers of movement. Okay, so that explains this board. We'll see what you think of it. And let's try to use the whale thing without belaboring it. I'm getting to a board that I, I want to really lean into before we go to Joanne. So same concepts that I just talked about, but let's do it visually. If you like a whale, if you're the hit and run model people, you don't have a huge amount of Western North America moving north during Baja BC time. You have some kind of Baja BC structure, either at the boundary between insular and intermontane or within intermontane. And so we're thinking of a whale in the hit and run model moving north between 85 and 55 million years ago. And by the way, this whale is the thing that hit North America, or North America hit. I know I've said that a million times. Okay, time to go. But if you're a mega whale person, Randy, Randy Enkin has paleo mag, Brian Mahoney, Paul Link, they're, they're fond of this concept of needing both of those terrains, both of those super terrains, intermontane and insular, joined together at the hip. Forget about the going south part, just joined together at the hip. And moving north. Let's do it, boy. Let's do it, boy. Mega whale. Everything west of the Tintina. Moving north. Maybe not starting at 85. <clears throat> And why do I say that? Joanne, this is the last chalkboard before we're coming to you. Same ideas, but presented in yet another way. So yes, I'm a fan of zooming out and zooming in. I think I'm the zoom out person in today's episode. And by the time we get to Joanne, we're going to zoom in. And maybe we'll just stay zoomed in. It's up to Joanne's comfort level. But here's Washington, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, down in the United States. Here's the 49th parallel. Here's Canada. We have Alberta province, British Columbia, Yukon, and Northwest Territory. What I've tried to do is simply put in, in a very cartoonish way, and this is a hand-drawn map, so things are whacked out, I'm sure. But here's the proposed fault next to a whale, and here's the proposed fault area that Stephen Johnston admitted is kind of cryptic. It's kind of, it should be obvious because it, it's a major structure, and yet we can't seem to find it. That's the concept we're talking about today. We're in the Rocky Mountains. 
in an area that was presumably thought to be old North America. And we're putting this proposed fault coming right through the Canadian Rockies. So yes, we're going here with Joanne, who has spent decades mapping. Sounds like she knows that area better than anybody. Intimate knowledge of the bedrock relationships up here in Northern British Columbia. But the last thing I'll do before we go to Joanne, two, two last things, is one, it seems to me both Churn Creek and Kachika Trough have some things in common, at least in this series. It's like we know the bedrock relationships well in these two places. And then I'm reading these papers that say there's a major fault coming through here. I just don't see it. This is a problem. The paleo mag is saying there's major offset, and yet I know the bedrock relationships, and there's just no. We, how could we have missed a major fault for more than 50 years mapping? I see that kind of message coming between different groups for both of those places. And yet I see the CarMax group up in the Yukon as different. I don't think I'm hearing that that's a, people are not mapping it correctly. But what I am hearing, and maybe you've heard as well to this point in the series, that the CarMax lobbies, whether they're related to the Yellowstone mantle plume or not, I don't think it matters at this point. We have 70 million year old lobbies and the paleo mag coming for those CarMax lobbies are surprisingly young and have surprisingly large paleo mag translation data. And so it's Looking at those numbers, and there's a difference of opinion that I still don't totally understand between Basil and Bernie and their brand new paper, that's their number for the CarMax, Randy and Stephen, 2006, more, Stephen and Jane Wynn and back in the 90s in the same ballpark. It seems to me this is the key site that forces some to have to go east of the CarMax to find this major structure. And I think our guest is saying, I just don't see that. I just don't see that structure. So let's go to her and learn from her. And she may have some surprises for me. Who knows? Well, let's see if we can go to Victoria, see if we can find somebody. Good afternoon, Joanne. Hey there, Nick. How are you? I'm good. Excellent. Happy to be you're, here. You're sounding good. I'm glad you can hear me. Your video looks good as well. So all systems go so far. Thank you for being part of this. And I'm wondering if we can start with you like we've started with a few other guests. Uh, where did you do your schooling? Was it up in Canada exclusively? Yeah, no, it wasn't. And this is kind of where I come into this debate. Um, I, I told you, Nick, last week when we were talking that yeah. I did my undergrad at the University of Washington. And I, oh, and I just want to talk about my own plate tectonic credentials. Good. My, my big mentor there was a geophysicist by the name of Robert Bostrom. He was this delightful, rosy-cheeked old English guy. And he was just so gone on the new play tectonics. And he was forcing papers into our hands. Like the Scientific American, I think it was 1968, had started writing these articles for the general reader about, you know, he's in and has some Vine and Matthews and all this stuff. So we get those. And then 1970, the year I arrived, Tanya Atwater's paper comes out. So I, I was, you know, I drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah. That was at University of Washington. Yeah. And um, so, and, yeah, please yeah. continue. So, I graduate there in 1973, and I wanted to get out of Dodge and go somewhere different. And so, I picked a foreign country, namely Canada. And so, I went up to UBC in 1973, and I was fascinated and delighted to hear Daryl Cowan's presentation because he was talking about how he came to University of Washington in 1974. You know, I'm out the door. He comes, he has the likes of John Garber and Mark Brandon and Paul Umhofer. And, you know, these guys form this radical cell. 
Well, if I had still been there, I would have been with them. <laughs> but my life and my faith took me to Canada, where instead I started to associate with Ge Geological Survey of Canada geologists, like the greats, like Monger and Gabriels. And eventually this led me myself to mapping in north central British Columbia, right where that mega fault is supposed to go. Well, can I, I'm curious. So you got a master's degree at, uh, was it University of Victoria? No, University of British Columbia. Okay. Oh, yeah, I have to show this. More play tectonic credentials. This is actually the T-shirt that the Dawson Club, the undergraduate club, passed out in 1973. Right? <laughs> this thing is, what, almost 50 years old? There you and go. There's a great little non-politically correct story about this shirt. It was a supposed dialogue between two female undergraduates, one of which was built like me, and the other one of whom was built much more generously. And the second gal said to the first, my continents are farther apart than yours. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, let's let's lean into that. What, 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 was, what was it like? You know I want to talk about this a little bit. What was it like as a woman in the 1970s in this world? Yeah, well, it was not good. Um, they were happy to have us as students. You know, we were decorative and amusing. And, um, but I actually had the phrase used to me actually earlier than that as a teenager of earnest, helpful friends informing me that my future was to be as a help meet. This language luckily has dropped out of the English language, but back then it was very serious indeed. Hmm. And in 1974, I'd finished my thesis work and I thought, well, it's time to get a summer job. And UBC was right with it, that this is the regional mineral exploration capital of Canada. And so every summer or every spring, the companies would send representatives out to interview all of the students. And most of them got jobs. So I went to all these interviews. And the one that choked me the most was they were working around a glacier. I was a mountaineer and a geologist, almost with a master's degree. They were going to hire climbers and undergraduates to work in teams. The climbers would protect the undergraduates. And I said, well, look, I can do both jobs, right? I didn't get an offer. Mm. The mm. dumbest kids that I TA'd, the dumbest first years, they got jobs. I didn't get a job. And the, there were a couple of interviewers who were braver than the rest who admitted that they could not hire women. And I, I was devastated. Like, I felt I've come all this way. By the way, I started to want to be a geologist when I was 14 years old. So I was pretty darn committed at that point. Yeah. yeah. And I just thought, you know, there's no place for me in this world. So, you know, you got to go with it. So I took an education degree and I taught high school. I'm actually... The Queen Charlotte Islands, if anybody knows where that is, um, for a year. And then after that year, I just thought, you know, swear words, swear words. I'm going to do this. So the year of no jobs was 1974. I came back to Vancouver. And by 1978, the world had changed. And we all got jobs. All we were. Really? It was just like that. Why do you think it changed so drastically in such a short amount of time? Society changed. It was it was just the time. Huh. I mean, this is women's liberation and better Betty Frieden and you know all this stuff. And society just took a look at it and changed. I didn't cause it. I benefited from it. Well, I we could do a whole episode on this, by the way. I mean it's <laughs> fascinating and heartbreaking and outrageous and everything else. Um, I guess we won't though, like in the middle of that time, you, you, you had a story about meeting Linda Nosen for the first time, who was our first guest in this series. Where, were, where was that meeting in this, in this time frame? 
the UBC uh, geology department at that point had its own library. Like we used books, right? We didn't Google things. Right. And so they had a vast collection of, you know, all the Geological Society of America bulletins and everything that GSC ever put out and blah, blah. And Linda, um, she explained that her husband got a gig at UBC. And so she came up and she got this job just temporary as a librarian. And I met her. And that was just when her paper had come out with Merle Beck, right? Uh -huh. And it started a revolution. Um, I provided my, my review of special paper 46, and yeah. she features prominently in the review. Right. Right. right? <laughs> well, that's really a cool intersection with, yeah. with yeah. what we're doing here. So um, must have been, must have been wild to see her in that first episode after 45 years or whatever it's been. Uh, it was great. And, yeah. you know, she's lived a whole life since then that I was not right. aware of. <laughs> and, yeah. so have you, and, and so have you. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, powerful stuff. Um, I don't know. Do you feel like you want to just go right into this or did you want to play off of what I was kind of setting you up with? Or how do you want to operate here, Joanne? Well, I want to give you a bit more background on me. Good. Um, or maybe I should preface this by saying that, you know, you've had a lot of people who are on the one side of the debate. Yeah. And so, you know, there was this sort of silly one to 10 scale or you fixed us and we'll do this. Um, what I want to advocate today is that story about me almost crossing paths with Daryl Cowan, but not. To me, this is absolutely key to the fundamental thing that's going on here. What we have are two, it's a conflict between two equally robust and equally valid and equally well-researched, I like to call them bodies of knowledge. So we have the bodies of knowledge that includes the paleomimic. I don't think it's totally restricted to it because you've had a lot of Americans talking about the geology of the American Cordillera. So I would put those things together and sort of call them a body of knowledge. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have the very well-known, very well-mapped geology of the Northern Canadian Cordillera. And this is another body of knowledge. And if you look at who's advocating in favor of Baja British Columbia, you will find that they have grown up and studied and spent their careers in that first body of knowledge. If you find people who are more, let's say skeptical, there I can guarantee you that they are people who have, you know, cut their teeth and spent their careers mapping in the Northern Cor Canadian Cordillera. Mm -hmm. So it's not fixes versus mobilists, right? Mm -hmm. It's people coming from different life experiences, like science, is a human life experience. Right. So that's where I'm coming from. And that's why I wanted to weave my personal story into it because Good. I'm like a counter example. Yeah. So there I am at UBC. And okay. then um, I finally, in 1978, I get my first job in industry, which was absolutely amazing. I was hired by a group called Resource Associates of Alaska. And they, it, this kind of thing doesn't exist anymore. They were a small consulting company, pure geology. They would get the big um, energy companies to hire them to do regional exploration. And so in June of 1978, we flew out of Fairbanks under a fair amount of clay. Didn't know where we were going. So there's just all these winding rivers, you know, you have no idea. We get into this camp. I set up my little tent. And the next morning, the sun come up. And I'm looking at the north side of the McKinley Range. And that's where I can work. I, mean, I was so high. Yeah. It must have been a dream. Yeah. It was amazing. Funny. Like I thought 1974, you're dead, right? Like yes. I'm, I'm here now. Yes. And another part of that was that, by the way, I never got to tell the story before Nick. And it's yeah. It's my story. So I became associated with this fellow named John Payne. 
who had gotten his PhD at Queen's University. And at the time he was either the, or one of the top three mapping geologists working in the mineral industry out of Vancouver. And we got hired to map properties at one to 5,000, one to 1,000, one to 10,000 scale, like super detailed mapping. I mean, you had to, because it cost $200 a foot to drill. So you had to be right. And German was like this combination of scientist, artist. And he was teaching me to do this on this steep face in Northern Vancouver Island. And so you're clambering up the rocks. And then he insisted that you had to find a place that you could safely stand. You get out your clipboard and you would draw like a landscape painter. You draw all the outcrops on the topographic map. And then you would go and visit each and every one and you would interrogate that outcrop. You didn't just record data. Yeah. You interrogated it. So that became my mapping style. And then in 1986, I had this tremendous break um, because mapping for industries, you know, it's a job, right? But I always wanted to work in tectonics. And in 1986, the BC Geological Survey, my dear employer, um, they put, put out four mapping jobs. And there were 400 applicants. And I got the last one of the four. Okay, okay. So then I was really ready to go. And um, I ended up working in the Sylvester Lockbun. And that's going to come into this discussion. This is this famous place where the three inner terrains of the Canadian Cordillera are stacked right on top of the platform. Mm -hmm. And I got to spend six years mapping that shit. <laughs> so that's me. Yeah. Well, was there a, what was the motive for that assignment for you for six years? Was it an economic motive? Or of course. Of course. The province of yeah. British Columbia wanted to do an inventory of its mineral resources. And, ooh, this is a bad word nowadays, but there was this huge mine there called the Cassiar Mine. The commodity, yeah. Vestas, out of the serpentinites, out of the overlay. <laughs> there was also, well, there was also, well, anyway. So that's in, in part what you're sharing with us. The late eighties, you're you're going up there field season after field season, yeah. and. That was a very specific chapter of your of your career that we're talking about today. Yeah, it was. I mean, I've worked other places in the Northern Cordillera. I've worked in Quinellia. Um, I've worked in Stikinia. Um, and I also formed these research friendships with others. Well, Monger, Hugh Gabriels was my predecessor. Mm -hmm. He had mapped this at one to two fifty thousand scale. Um, wonderful, wonderful man, wonderful scientist. And then my contemporaries at the Yukon Geological Survey, um, particularly Maurice Copron and Don Murphy. Um, so we all started to dedicate ourselves to the same kinds of issues. And we spent a lot of focus on the Yukon Tanhanoff terrain together. And we actually came out with a special volume just before 46, special yeah. 45 is all about you, Gontan. Oh, you got it. The ah, oh, this is 46. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. 45 is the blue volume on the you got Canada not train. So, so that's my background. And those are the folks that I have worked with intimately on solving Northern Cordillera problems. So that that's why I say I represent this other research. Well, terrific. That, that backstory really helps, I think. So thank you for, for, for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. So so now we want to cut into the, the CARMAX data. Okay. You're absolutely correct in saying that this poses this enormous challenge. Like before, and I must confess, I didn't believe the CARMAX data until Randy finally put out his 2006 paper. I hoped it would go away. 
But, you know, Randy is a fabulous scientist. And when he, in, in your special volume 46, he publishes on Mount Tatlow, Churn Creek, he publishes on, on Carmax, and then he wrote that wonderful paper summing it all up, telling us these are the best poles. We know paleo horizontal. These poles pass all the tests. You can't ignore that. You might hate it. You might, it might feel like being stung by a swarm of bees, but you can't ignore it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he poses the problem and okay, here we go. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, that Baja BC fault. What is it? Where is it? When did it move? What would it look like? You know, all those, like, it would be worth listing these things. So number one, the Baja BC fault must go between the Carmax Pole and ancestral North America. I guess we don't know exactly where because I don't even know where the poles for North America are, but somewhere between Carmax and, and there, okay? Mm -hmm. This fault must be through going because it must have at least 2,000 kilometers displacement. And, you know, some little fault that runs up against a, a Jurassic pluton and dies will not work. That will not do your job for you. It's, that sucker has got to go all the way down. Right? Yeah. Agreed? Yes. And it probably isn't like Marky Resmore nailed it. You asked her, what would it look like? And she said, well, it wouldn't be a single strand. I mean, look at the San Andreas. So what I imagine that fault would look like is like a San Andreas with up to 10 times the amount of displacement that you see on the San Andreas today, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And the nest, if, if we're just talking paleomet, the necessary time of displacement, as you said earlier, between 85 and 55 million years ago. So you have to find this scale of fault that's doing that scale of thing in and only in that interval. So faults that are doing their job in the Jurassic or the early Cretaceous, they don't help you. Faults whose major displacement is in the Cenozoic do not help you, right? So it's really, really pinned down here as to what this thing has to be, where is it, what does it look like, when did it move? And I wanna bring one more concept in before I let fly. Um, and that is, okay, you're, you're imaging this Baja BC block as a whale. Um, I'd like, just for today's purposes, to refer to it as a bus. A bus? A big okay. bus. And the reason for that is, um, oh, God. Oh. I'm having a senior's moment. Okay. Well, you know, like, I was going to say to be leery, and I knew that was wrong. Um, so in the 60s, he drove around in this bus all across America, right? This is before your time, my friend. Um, I think I've read about it. Ken Casey? Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. The Merry Pranksters. Yeah. And at one point, some of the Merry Pranksters are kind of like, they, they're wanting to do their own thing, right? And Casey just goes, Either you're on the bus or you're off the bus. Yeah, Casey. <laughs> that Tony? That was Tony. I said Casey. Yeah. I, I only made the mistake for a minute. Right. So the reason I want to do this is because, because of this huge displacement, there can be no piercing points. There can be no correspondence between what's on the bus and what's off the bus, okay? You agree with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, we are led to this conclusion by the description of this fault. So now I want to share my screen. 
<laughs> I mean, I'm going to bring it in, but I just have to tell you, you're doing an excellent job. This is just our series. So thank yeah. you. Just keep doing yeah. what you're doing. It's great, yeah. Joanne. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm not ignoring the paleo mag, okay? I got you. I got you. <laughs> so um, I wanted to show, this is the hit and run model. Yeah. And I wanted to show how this is not possible because it's mixing up things that are on the bus or it's got things off the bus that actually are on the bus or things on the bus that are actually off the bus. So here's the bus, okay? So this, this is the main part of the intermontane terrains. But they've left off these two little pieces here and here. Now, uh, I suppose if, if, you know, your main field of expertise is the conterminous US, this wouldn't disturb you greatly. But I can tell you it disturbs me. Um, because these two little pieces, the farther north one, that's called, this is Jim Mortensen's, Jim Mortensen's famous Yukon Tana Now Banana, because it's shaped like a banana. Mm -hmm. That is the piece of the Yukon Tana Now that is on the inboard side of the Tintina Fault. And so the customary restoration is that you run the Tintina Fault back until the edge of the, Tintina, of the edge of the Yukon Tanana west of it fits that east of it. Okay, so that would rot Mortensen's socks. But the one that rots my socks is this. This is the Sylvester lock fun that I mapped. Mm -hmm. And the Sylvester Alokthon is a stack of three Alokthons, actually. The bottommost one that sits directly on North America is Slide Mountain Terrain, which is a marginal basin of late Paleozoic age. Then on top of it is a late Paleozoic arc sequence called the Harper Ranch, which belongs to Quinellia. And then highest of all, is a unit called the Rapid River Tectonite that is correlated with the Yukon Tanana terrain to the west. Now, this whole thing, all these lock lines plus the underlying platform, are intruded by the Cassiar batholith that runs along the Cassiar Fault. That's one of these Cretaceous dextral faults. And if you walk the Cassiar Fault on the west side of the batholith, so Cassiar Bathlith cuts all these units. Okay, so all of the, all of the thrust faults, all of the units, all of the accretion was before Cassiar Bathlith. Um, moreover, the Cassiar fault is expressed in the Western Cassiar Bathlith as a zone of myelinite, beautiful myelinite. Um, but cutting that are some late phases of Bathlith, and here they are. And this pegmatite thing, this muscovite granite thing. Joanne dated, and the answer is 108. 108. Plus or minus one. So that stuff belongs to North America, and it is also it also belongs to the West. So you cannot do that. That that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Um. And if people want more detail on this, I I posted, um, yeah, back to me. Um, so I posted one of the papers in this book that I really love. This is Hugh Gabriel's working with Don Murphy and Jim Morrison. And they do an excellent reconstruction of the faults that actually do exist in that part of the Cordillera. Um, so like here's, Here's their reconstruction of the Tintina Fault. Oh, I've added this. Yeah, you have to read the yep. paper. But they've got like 10 different piercing points on the Tintina Fault to document that 400 to possibly 490 kilometers. And they further make the point that most of, of the displacement on the fault would have been Eocene because that's when you get all these little strikes of basins developing in it full of Eocene. Eocene age strata, and then there's an earlier set of faults that are like the like the Cassiar fault that are 
Cretaceous. And they, and unfortunately, um, the youngest motion on them is 100. Like they get cut off by these bad bullets. So the, the problem is that the best information from the Northern Cordillera doesn't provide for any fault system in that crucial 85 to 55 million year time interval. Like nothing at all. And if you do try and run something through that, you run into all these older Cretaceous faults, you run into Jurassic thrust faults, you, you run into Jurassic batholiths. Like it's just, it, you know, you try and play this game, but it, you all, it's all plugged up. You can't do it. So that's the problem. Well, I know you have, I have, know you have more slides, but I'm just curious, like, what do we do with the CarMax then? I'm not going to answer that question today because, you know, what people always do is they go, well, I, you know, I'm sure of my model, so you must be wrong. But I'm not going to tell that to Randy Ankin. <laughs> like, maybe in life we don't always come to a final answer, yeah. right? You get frustrated. Right. But at the same time, you wouldn't have this series had this been solved. Right, totally. Right? Yeah. And what yeah. I'm thinking out about this is like this really puts us to what is the nature of our science? What is the nature of doing science? Um, and what do you do when, mm -hmm. when you hit a boundary like this? Mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, how do you conduct yourself? Well, um, Thank you. Let's proceed. I know you have some slides with maybe your PowerPoint, or you had a few other things before we get to that. However, you Whoa. want to keep rolling here, Joanne. Sure. Um, oh, yeah. Here, I just wanted to show because Steve had those great suffering shots, right? And yeah. I do think that's part of it is how hard you work to get your data. You, yeah. you become invested. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, if you don't become invested, if you don't work hard, then you're not doing your job, right? And one thing Randy didn't talk about is the amount of unsuccessful poll determinations that he has made. So, you know, for every time I would go up a creek and never find an outcrop, like he's, he's encountered that barrier to science as well. So this is an important part of the discussion. And so to respond to that, I just wanted, I've got a few suffering shots that. Uh... Excellent. Excellent. Oh, look at that. Right? Wow. So in 1987, I actually used horses to get around. And so that was the outfitter, the guy, the guy offering the glass of whatever, box of whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, we were pretty miserable. And let's see. This is fun. This well, is really I, fun. I, I, um, oh, and this this was another suffering shot. So we're we're drawing we're drawing the map out on the clipboard there because yeah. we use mylar because it's the only thing you can use out there. And keep drying his boots by the fire and burning them and stuff. Um, <laughs> and and then also you know to get at this naughty problem, I just wanted to say it is not for lack of effort on our part. Um, I actually pulled together this session in 2012 in the offices of the Geological Survey Branch, and people might recognize some of the people there. Um, that, that's Jim Munger, mm -hmm. Murphy, that's Sharon Carr from Carlton, and that's Maurice Copron. And it, our basic exercise, I thought, let's make this concrete. So we took um, not the tectonic assemblage map of Canada, but we took actually the equivalent, the new map of British Columbia, the new map of the Yukon, the new map of Alaska. We pasted them all on form, foam core, and then we took the knives to it. We went at it with box cutters, and we cut along every possible fault we could find and restored every possible fault we could find. And um, guess what? It turned out that the restoration that we made was very close to what Sandra Wild 
has come up with. And I wanted to say, I love her paper. And I mean, she followed the rules. She, she restored these vaults as one should. And then she came up with, I, I'm sure you noticed this, Nick, that in her bar, like the Ingalls Ophiolite restores exactly next to the Josephine Ophiolite, like, you know, lost twins. Right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and the answer is um, um, that in the gate at all, they, they allow for 860 across the entire origin and yeah. she allows for something like 900. So we're all dealing with the same data and we're all coming up with the same answers. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, oh, and I just had one more in that subject. Oh yeah, um, this is the kind of thing we, we got up to. So that was some intermediate step. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Very fun. Uh, yeah, it went for, I think we had like five different sessions on the same set of puzzle pieces. And <laughs> we never published anything because it, just, it gave the same answers as everybody else had always got. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so that led to, and I should say, of, of the modelers, like, I guess we have the hit and run, we have the Hildebrand, we have um, Steve Johnson. Um Steve, like he was part of the Yukon Geological Survey. So he he knew darn well what we were finding in those Eastern intermontane dunes. And that's why he was the first guy to say, okay, if it's not here in the Eastern intermontane terrains, then we've got to go on to what's been called North America. So that's all that, that's how all that happened. Like <laughs> He's trying to make logical connections. Like he's trying to say, okay, Carmex is correct. The geology my colleagues are, are mapping is correct. So let's go to North America. Unfortunately for him, I had been there first. Um, he first published his model in 2001. And so most of my life I spent in the accreted trains. That's where I'm happiest, right? I, I love it. <laughs> um, but in 1994, my colleague, uh, Phil Ferry, and I got assigned to map the Kachika Trough. It turned out the BC government at the time was, was quite liberal. And they, the, the United Nations had said, said in a report that every jurisdiction in the world should have 12% protected areas. BC government was all over this and they intended to do it in one term, like in one four year period. So they sent all the scientists out, you know, the bear scientists and the rock scientists and the tree scientists and, you know, whatever. And we had to collect data about these potential park areas. So we had to go on the Northern Autochthon and trace out what I thought were all these boring, like I don't even like, I, I flunked stratigraphy. As a, <laughs> I just, I hate memorizing formation. <laughs> but there we were, you know, doing our job. And so this little presentation has to do, oh, I see. So this little presentation has to do with what Phil and I found when we we're mapping the Kachika trough. Mm -hmm. And so in, in keeping with my theme, it is on the bus or off the bus. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so Kachika trough, follow the yellow arrow, is a Paleozoic interfertonic basin that lies within the western margin of Laurentia. Because it wasn't North America yet, right back in the Devonian. It forms a narrow southern extension of the broader Selwyn Basin. And if you look at those little orange boxes, it hosts a linear trend of Devonian sedimentary exhalative deposits, which typically form like in the Red Sea. The, these are, are the equivalent of black smokers with no volcanics around. 
and a set of coeval and probably co-genetic of uh, Mississippi Valley deposits is hosted by the Bologna carbonates to the east. So like I say, it was an economic study. Mm -hmm. Now, both Rubia and Sabia ribbon continent models require a Cretaceous ocean frozen feature along or near the eastern margin of the Kachika trough that juxtaposes it against para-autochthonous shelf sequences. Well, this assertion is testable against mapped and studied geological relationships in and adjacent to the Kachika Trough. So first stop, the Western Shelf Edge. This is called Rob Lake. It's, a, it's a, an MV, MVT deposit. And as part of the project, I mapped that region at one to 20,000 highly detailed scale. So at the grossest scale, what you have is on the right-hand side, to the east, you have a carbonate shelf consisting of Silurian through Devonian, mainly carbonate straight up. And then to the southwest, you have sloped ba basinal fasces, Cambrian through Silurian in age. Now, one of the formations on the shelf is called the non-deformation. It's a gray Silurian dolostone that contains the following corals, Favocytes and Helicytes. And in my mapping on this little ridge, I found a non-derived dolostone breccia, Silurian, same, same fossil, overlying um, basinal strata. So if you're going to say that the shelf is not on the bus and this breccia is on the bus, you have to explain why this thing that was for all the world, you know, like a debris flow breccia coming off of that reef, you know, how did, how did these two things man manage to get right together after mm -hmm. two to three thousand kilometers of displacement. Mm -hmm. Not likely, right? So, okay, well let's look at the broader trough. So you have to the east the McDonald platform, uh, primarily defined by middle ordivision, middle to bone and carbonate formations and silicoplastic things. Oh, and in it there's this interesting thing called the Musqua High which is a single uplift of middle Proterozoic Musqua assemblage. Then the trough is primarily defined by middle Ordovician to upper Devonian deep water, fine-grained carbonate, the carbonaceous siliciclastic units of the Road River and urn groups. That's not all that's there, but that's how it's defined. So seen at this level of resolution, the trough is not a uniform blob of the ribbon continent models. Instead, it comprises a set of thrust implicated panels with internal stratigraphic sequences that each one ranges from Neoproterozoic to Mississippian. Okay, now let us focus on its internal structure and stratigraphy in this exceptionally well exposed and well studied area. This is what Phil published in 1998. Okay, so first thing to notice is the Road River group. So urn is in blue, Road River in gray. That these are actually erosional remnants sitting on top of older strata. And here they are. So it is these thin bedded carbonaceous basal strata that tempt some modelers to postulate that this Kachika trough was a major oceanic tract. Mm. Well, let me just say to begin with that this is not a Cretaceous ocean. There is no Cretaceous strata here. In fact, the youngest stratified rocks in the Kachika trough are actually Triassic. Okay, so these are old basin rocks. But also, um, like the Road River group coarsens upwards to mainly dolomitic siltstone, 
which is also coarsest and thickest bedded in its westernmost exposures, suggesting that we're getting near the western edge of this trough. And this Silurian siltstone is commonly bioturbated with many parallel trace fossils, such as zoophytes. So this is not your Ingalls ophiolite, right? Mm -hmm. this, right? This is an interplutonic basin. Um, and similarly, the westernmost fasces of the urn group is a chert quartz conglomerate that sits structurally on this much finer stuff, the gun steel. So this is consistent with local Western sediment sources. Again, saying this trough had two sides. And really, if you restore it, all, all you do is a balanced cross-section. And you know it's only like 50 kilometers wide or maybe 100. So, so, so much for the basin units. Now let's look at what's underneath them. Um, and in I, I actually put a full copy of this presentation in the references. I won't dwell on it. I want to talk about this highly distinctive, unique unit that ties the Western Gachika trough to the adjacent autochthon. It's mm -hmm. called the Middle Cambrian Roosevelt Formation. And there it is in three different thrush sheets. Okay. So it's a polymactic granular to boulder conglomerate, maroon siltstone, shale, limestone, calcareous siltstone. And in this particular area, it's restricted to this belt here between Brownie and Terminus Mountains. There it is. It's, it's really distinctive. Like there's nothing else like that around. Like we're in a sea of carbonates and shales and sandstones. Like this, this is very distinctive. The class are quartzite, limestone, mudstone, siltstone, basalt diorite, um, probably derived from the underlying Neoproterozoic. And note for future reference the maroon color of the matrix. That's one thing that distinguishes it. Now, in the whole wide world, or at least in the entire, well, yeah, the entire Canadian Cordillera, there's only one other occurrence of the Roosevelt Formation besides where Phil and I looked at it, and that's right here around Muncha Lake. This was mapped by Daryl Wong and one of his students. And there it is near Muncha Lake. It, it, it is a dead ringer for what Phil and I looked at, same fossil, same everything. So, this and these represent the world's store of Roosevelt formation. Mm. Um, so if that's not on the bus, why would you put that on the bus? It doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Yeah. And this is how it's actually modeled, that you have these two little grobbins um, forming in Middle Cambrian time. And this is actually the precursor of the Kachika trough. Like at that point, we just call it Kachika Graben system. And it's only in this period, Middle Ordovician through early Mississippian, that the trough is a trough. That's when the Road River group and the Black Shales and the Urn group and the more Black Shales get deposited. So, like, th this is an intercatonic basin. There we go. The observation. East and South Martin is a platform to get basin fascist fronts that migrates through time. The stratified units each show shallow to deep water to shallow water fascists across the trough, except for Roosevelt Formation, but that's its own thing. The Roosevelt Formation is this unique conglomeratic unit that only occurs in that area. So it's interpreted as Robin Hill. So the bottom line is, you know, you can't say it's a cryptic Cretaceous suture. It's a non-existent Cretaceous suture. Okay. I see the logic. I love how you laid it out. 
And I did really enjoy not only your slides, but the papers that you sent as well. And all six viewers, all six of those papers are available for you. Yeah. When I'm done with Joanne here, I'll, I'll go to the laptop like I normally do and show you how to find those things so that you can follow through. Especially if you have, I'm talking to the viewers, like if you have personal experience with some of those places or you just can't quite place what we're talking about. That's what I need to do since I've never been up in this country. Yeah, it's the top. It's the top of the hour, viewers. We're going to come to you in just a couple of minutes. So please get your up, jo Joanne. I hope you're okay for some questions from our oh, viewers. Sure. Okay. Uh, so viewers, get your questions ready and, and type those in. Um, I I'm curious. It felt like much of what you sent me was from just a couple of years ago. Was there some sort of and that was in the middle of COVID? Was there some sort of like virtual? Oh. Yes. conference or something talking about this? Yes, uh, the Geological Association of Canada boldly chose to do its entire national meeting in 2020 virtually. And they pulled it off marvelously. They, you know, they got the right techie guys and, you know, you had to record your talk ahead of time. So the version of the talk that they had, you know, there was this little microphone thing and you know uh, it just played and i was invited to that by um margo mcmeckin with the geological survey of canada alberta office and one of my references is her paper with phil simony um which kind of mirrors what i did only in the southern court era Mm -hmm. They they looked at all the different fascies of relationships and ties and they they call it something like links and nails that they they can build platformal strata to basal strata like right from the Alberta subsurface you know across the Rocky Mountain Trench so you know you can't ignore that either right well. Um it's really fun to read that stuff firsthand as opposed to kind of like search for it uh, on our mm -hmm. own. And if, if nothing else, that's what this series is trying to do. We're trying to not only visit with some of you folks directly, but also read your work uh, specifically. So viewers, please, um, whatever you'd like to ask here, I'll try to pass them along to Joanne. And it, it can be, uh, you know, part of her history as well, I suppose, if you're comfortable, Joanne, like expanding on some of your early days and some of those challenges we were talking about. Um, all right, and, and you can pass on some of these, Joanne. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna lob some of these towards you. So uh, Sky is asking, how far south do you think the Tintina Fault goes? Um, Sky. Do, do please read uh, the Gabriel's at all paper. Um, I have not worked at the southern end of it. It, it goes into the, first into the northern Rocky Mountain Trench Fault and then into the southern Rocky Mountain Trench Fault. And you'll see that their references, um, the pattern is that the displacement decreases sy systematically as you go south. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Elaine asks, uh, does this evidence invalidate the entire ribbon continent model or just in your area? Um, well, that's a question to pose to the ribbon modelers. Like, how can you have a ribbon continent that only exists some places and not others? I don't think mm -hmm. you can. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I can toss in one. Like, uh, you are aware of all that paleo mag from Randy and many, many others. So do you see, do you know of any structures in the Cache Creek or something further west of the area we're talking about today that makes sense to you for doing some northward translation? Or do you not want to go that direction? Um, well, the Cache Creek is involved in the restoration of some of these um, Cretaceous faults, the, the early to mid Cretaceous faults. Um, so no, I do not. But maybe it's time for me to talk about my personal reaction to all of this. I, I thought about it a lot ever since Randy invited me. And I would like to introduce the, the idea of cognitive dissonance. 
Okay. In the human brain, cognitive okay. dissonance occurs when you have two thoughts, both of which seem ineluctable, inescapable. And I compare it to like if you have a little bar stool and you have two big beefy guys trying to sit on it and even try to get a cheek on, what happens is that you can't hold those two thoughts in your, in your head at once. And so you revert to your favorite one. And as I exclaimed, I struggled to map the geology. I revert to that one. Randy struggled to get those poles. He reverts to that one. That's the best I can do. That's, that's hilarious, first of all. Nice job. But also, um, would you mind uh, sharing, like Randy's the guy that suggested you for this series. I wasn't yeah. thinking of contacting you and did you guys have some sort of meeting before his session or in this series or how did that go oh. how did that come about well i guess you and you invited him right and yeah. he said yes to you yes and as soon as he accepted your invitation randy goes well oh, i wonder if joanne would like to be on this series so he wrote to me and at first you know, at times this, this con I hate conflict or I hate irresolvable conflict. And at, at times over the years, this has been a real thorn in my side. I've had, you know, like physical stress symptoms. And I said, no, I don't want to do it. And then I thought, hmm, I see. Linda Nosen is first on. I'm going to listen to that. And then I just got sucked into it because I realized this was like this human story. And that I, I too was part of it. That's how it happened. I'm great. I'm grateful for you for, for being open to that. I'm glad that that Linda episode uh, sucked you in a little bit. That's great. And, and <laughs> beyond after that. Uh, Douglas wonders, what is the approximate age of the Roosevelt structure? Uh, well, it'd be middle, middle Cambrian. So somewhere in the 500s. Okay. Uh, a couple more here. Uh, you've already given us a lot of time. I appreciate that. Um, are you retired? I am emeritus. Okay. Which means that I still, I'm in my office here and I'm still writing up papers. I just put out a paper on, um, it's called the Golden Triangle. It's a part of Stachinia that's very rich for gold, silver, <laughs> copper porphyries in the Mesozoic time. So I'm still going at it. And I actually have a paper with Brian Mahoney that's been put on hold because of course, you know where Mahoney is right now. Antarctica. Oh yeah, yeah. What do you got, what are you guys working on? Well, um, we did a, a project 10 years ago with George Garrels looking at the Alexander terrain um, on the North coast of British Columbia. So, oh yeah, if I can throw this in, just to prove that I'm not a fixist. Um, Maurice Coco and I got into this idea that, okay, the intermontane terrains, you can in some way assign to places near North America for most of the time we, we have recorded. But the insular terrains are quite a different story, as is Arctic Alaska, as is the farewell terrain. And it just sort of came to us in a like plof about 2006 that these terrains actually tracked back to near Siberia or near Russia, near the Ural Mountains and the Northern Caledonites. And we wrote up this great paper, it's called the Northwest Passage because it describes all these things coming through the Arctic Basin and the Devonian. So I always hoped that I would be able to actually do some field work in one of these terrains and the GSC came up with this project in 20, 2009. Um, and they weren't nearly as economically oriented as my survey. So ha ha, we got to go look at the Alexander tree. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there paleo mag on the Alexander that works well with, with your work? Well, no, we're, we're looking at 
much older history, but okay. you know, it, it doesn't get discussed in here, but you know, there's great paleomag from the Nikolai Carmusin basalts yeah. that Ted Irving yeah. did. And those poles make a whole lot of sense with respect to the geology. Huh. And at one point there was this throwaway remark that Ted made. He said something about, you know, that Nikolai, that was a great magnetization. And I don't think, I mean, in a way, he was sort of saying, well, maybe some of that Cretaceous stuff we did wasn't quite as great as the Nikolai. Hmm. Well, look, how about we finish with this, Joanne? So let's bring it full circle. You, you running into Linda Nosen in the you know, mid-70s, early to mid-70s, and being aware of that Baja BC work with her and Merle Beck. Hmm. Uh, did you deal much with Ted Irving? over the years, or is it just this ribbon stuff lately that has kind of intersected you with some of these Baja BC thoughts, or was that something that keeps cop cropping up through your entire career? Well, remember my career was in the inner part of the Cordillera. And so basically, um, as I understand it, Ted Irving and the Coast Mountains geologists, like, he and, and Monger had difficulty seeing eye to eye because it was Monger who was expected to come up with these structures and Monger could not. And so I was like a fly on the wall to that debate. And I thought, oh, thank God, you know, it has nothing to do with me. And then suddenly the ribbon work is, it, suddenly it's showing up in right. the neighborhood. Oh my God, it's here. The whale is here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I want to thank you for your time. I thought you just did an excellent job. And I, I know that the viewers are, are going to have all sorts of nice comments. So I hope you get a chance to watch this replay at some point and see all these nice comments. So yeah. um, thank you so much. Anything else you wanted to add before we say goodbye? No, thank you, Nick. You're, you're doing a wonderful service here. And I'm sure your viewers just, you know, they look forward to these sessions. Well, I do too. So thank you for saying that. Well, uh, great job. I hope to visit with you again sometime down the road, but really great meeting you and thank you for all of your uh, time today. Bye, Nick. Okay. Bye-bye. See you. Joanne Nelson from British Columbia, from Northern BC, from Southern BC, from Eastern BC. She's been around and she's seen a lot and it was a real thrill to hear from her directly. I hope you enjoyed that. I think as I've been doing uh, most recently, I'd like to go to the laptop, show you those papers you even get all the slides you just saw from Joanne are also waiting for you. And then, uh, I don't know, we'll see if I feel like I want to be playful before we quit here. Um, okay, to the laptop. You're still here, and I assume we're still working? Great. So, yeah, nickzentner.com, that's the place to go, at least for these papers. We click on the word Baja BC, and that gets us to this Look at the length of this list, by the way. I just noticed this. I'm going to run into the Stewart range. Like this is at the bottom of our web page, and this is these are the wind turbines we have on the margin of our valley. And here's the skyline as it looks. This is an actual photo, I believe, that's been converted into this graphic. So I mean, I mean, come on. I don't know if you've been with us the entire series, but. And I'm not ready to like look back on the whole series. I guess that will be next week. But remember, my my main motivation for doing this Baja BC thing is I see that skyline every day. It's right over there, especially on a morning like today. It took a long walk. We had some light snow overnight before it cleared out with the skies. And Mount Stewart to me is, and to many people, is the kind of face of this entire Baja BC controversy or conundrum or debate or discussion or whatever you want to call it. And uh, Merle Beck started all that with Linda Nosen. So yeah, 
this this list is about to encroach into the Stewart range itself. It's so long, and we've got a few more letters to go. But Joanne, in two or three different emails, uh, was uh, very generous with her time to gather up these papers. I'll start down here. Uh, this is from that volume that I was holding up to the camera. And this is the her predecessor um, doing something very similar to what Sandra Wild was doing with Paul Umhofer, taking the known faults and restoring them to, uh, to talk about, look, the faults we know about, if we restore them, we have X number of kilometers of offset. It's nowhere near what the paleomag is saying, generally. Here is Joanne writing a book review of, I can hold it up to the little camera. This is the book I'm talking about. That's kind of fun. And she tells her Linda Nelson story in there. And here is from this virtual event. Now, it seemed like a number of these presentations were specifically uh, pushing back against the ribbon continent, which surprised me. I didn't know that there was such a kind of galvanized effort uh, to even even Jane Wynn mentioning the crow's nest uh, is is acknowledged and discussed briefly here. So these are kind of a collection of abstracts and short papers and the slides I'm about to share with you. Um, Nailed to the Craton. I almost called this episode that. Maybe I should have. Uh, but I like that's kind of a poetic thought. And it's the same idea. We're walking across the Kachika Basin, and you undo the thrust vaulting. You can follow those units. And lots of specific arguments against having a major structure coming through their home turf. Here are the slides that you just enjoyed, at least I hope you enjoyed them, from Joanne, BC Geological Survey. So I don't need to scroll through these, you just saw them. Uh, and finally, there's the abstract that goes along with those slides. An abstract is kind of a, a condensed or greatest hits version of a presentation. Well, what do I have here? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. So Joanne was talking about a bus today. Uh, I'm not prepared to whip up a bus uh, graphic uh, on the spot, uh, but here's Randy Hankin being in the spirit of things a month ago and putting a mega whale, an actual photo of the Vinman's whale and blowing it up and making it into a mega whale. And I took a, a photo of the mega whale that I shared with you at the beginning of the show. So thanks one more time to Jeff, the owner of Vinman's Bakery, for this mega whale, which I think I'll use one more time before I say goodbye to you. Uh, why not? This is from the fixed archipelago folks, Mitch Mahalanuk and Karen Siglok. And if I can get here and drive, purple is intermontane, orange is insular. They're joined. So they're making, Mitch and Karin are making a mega whale at about 120. Can I point to it? There's the mega whale right there. We're stitching these two guys together. The orange itself is Basil's regular whale, skinny, svelte whale. But we've got a big old fat mega whale with Mitch and Karin. And I want to stick with it because I was playing with this this morning. Let's get to 85. Okay, we're supposed to start Baja BC northward translation at 85. Well, I guess we do. Can you look right in here? The easternmost portion of mega whale, or if you like, the easternmost portion of intermontane, purple. The fixed archipelago folks, they start Baja BC 85, but it's on a strike slip fault within the intermontane. Now, Mitch is involved in this. So is this Cache Creek? Our topic today is 
up here in old North America. And so to me, this is, I could be corrected down the road. I don't know. But to me, this is a difference between fixed archipelago and the ribbon continent that we're not, we're not sending a structure through old North America. We're sending it through at least a portion of intermontane, but let me play along further. Again, we're still doing northward translation of the mega whale, but the Baja BC fault, again, I'm looking right in here, is within Intermontane. Shit, sorry, Patrick. Oh, come on. Thank you for your patience. Okay. But then at... Now, I don't know how real this is. I don't know if this is just kind of throwing it out there or if this is carefully confined or ca carefully uh, manufactured by the paleomag or by the tomography. I don't know. But I'm looking at about, well, I don't know, let's, let's round it, 70. Starting about 70. Now, even that sliver of intermontane is heading north. So, in other words, we're not continuing to go intra intermontane. We're, we're 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 deciding to switch to a mega whale completely. And I can only guess. Might be fun to follow up somehow. I can I can only guess that that switch at about seventy is because of the Carmax. Carmax happens here. And in this model, am I splitting hairs? Am I way off? I don't know. Oh shit, can I enlarge this? Well, let me play it. let me finish it first. So now we have the entire intermontane going north, and now it appears we do have the Tintina, or I don't know. I don't really know. But we're gonna finally get everybody to their final resting place at 48, which is considerably younger than 55. Try to zoom. I'm wasting your time now, but I'm kind of playing. Oh, I can't zoom. Okay. So, yes, we're back to Hildebrand now and thinking about ribbon continent and having a through going fault. I don't think we need to belabor this, but I'm just reminding you visually of uh, what Hildebrand is proposing and possibly Johnston as well. Back to Joanne today, because of her mapping, she does not see any major structure. Here's from Hildebrand, same kind of a graphic. And maybe I still don't know enough about the details in this to see that he does see a major structural difference. Um, and we're, we're into our cryptic suture now. Yeah, big country. Photo from Joanne. Oh, I don't know. No, I think our point is made. This is kind of odd, I have to say. I'm, I'm literally standing at my laptop just with my mouth open, like, uh, kind of playing around. And I kind of forget that all you guys are here. Don't take it the wrong way, but it's just, it's such a, you know, it's an empty room. There's people walking by out in the hallway, but otherwise it's just, it's, uh, this is so comfortable now that I, I don't forget that you're here, but I, I do feel totally relaxed when I, you know, I just, it's like I'm at home. <laughs> Strange. Okay. Um, a toast to you. Here's to you for joining us today on a Wednesday afternoon in early February. I had to look. Sunheim, to your health. Here's to our guest today, our special guest, Joanne Nelson from British Columbia Geological Survey. Longtime employee. Thank you, Joanne, for your time and your energy in preparing and then delivering your messages today. Really enjoyed it. 
Thanks to all the guests that have come before and the guests that will come after today. We still have a few more shows. Here's to all the guests. Speaking of which, what do we know and what do we not know about the remaining letters? Well, here's what we know. Session X on Saturday, Section Y next Wednesday, and Session Z a week from Saturday rounds out the alphabet. Still working on the final two shows, but I do know that our next show, Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time, will feature Chris Mattinson. And Chris and I are having lunch tomorrow, Thursday, and we'll hatch a plan. We don't know yet what we're going to do, but we have some ideas. Will it go right? Will we be going right back to the Tintina and thinking about thin skinned pizza boxes that are potentially concealing a major structure? Or will we retreat with Chris Mattinson to a single whale as opposed to a mega whale? In other words, will we scale back and zoom down to insular? Or maybe we'll talk about the North Cascades with Chris Mattinson and talk about pros and cons of connecting his very old Plutonic rocks in the North Cascades, the Chelan Migmatite feeding an Okanagan range batholith. Maybe tie that to the Omanika belt. Just throwing things out, Chris. Will we give Chris Mattinson a day off on Saturday and just go, you work so hard anyway, Chris. Why don't you just stay home and enjoy the sun? And maybe we'll just uh, have a, a cat lovers episode. And speaking of cat lovers, one more look at the mega whale. I hope it's clear to you what the mega whale is. I mean, maybe you haven't been watching all these shows, but the mega whale is the concept of taking all this stuff and moving it as a unit, possibly between 70 and 50 million years ago. Cue the mega whale. Cue the mega whale. Oh, I gotta really do it. I'm afraid. Mega whale started 70 million years ago. According to the ribbon continent people. Mega whale with Carmax on it. Oh shit, man. Maybe the eyes the Carmax. <laughs> That's heavy. Thank you. I love you and goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. We'll see you Saturday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific with Chris Mattinson for the mystery episode. I love you. Did I say that? I love you. Goodbye. End stream. End stream. Mega whale, mega bus, magic school bus, Miss Frizzle, <laughs> Ken Kesey. <laughs>